Welcome to ESGX Live, the community for education and information to inspire collaboration and action on all things to do with sustainability. With me, Nigel Lake here in Harlem, New York, and my co-host Paul Herman in San Francisco. We have a really wonderful show coming up for you today with the inimitable Dr. Jane Goodall, who joins us from the top of her house in Bournemouth uh, in the United Kingdom, not too far away from where I grew up as well uh, a few years ago myself. And who better to ask the questions today than middle school student Julia Drainville. To, we'll also hear from Melanie Mortimer and Elizabeth Rydell from the SIFMA Foundation. To get you in the mood, we have a short film from the Jane Goodall Institute that tells you just a little of Jane's story. Uh, and as we watch that, perhaps you could introduce yourselves to each other in the chat function. Let us know where you're from, what you're interested in. And when we get to the questions, we'll also answer your questions uh, through the Q&A. Anyway, here's the quick introduction. In 1960, a young British woman ventured into the forests of Africa to follow her childhood dream, to find a way to watch free wild animals living their own undisturbed lives. She left everything familiar behind and ended up giving the world a remarkable window into our closest living relatives. She was me. I wanted to come as close to understanding animals as I possibly could. We are continuing our research at Gombe. It's the longest running study of any non-human animal. And we're using some exciting new technology to learn more about chimpanzee ranging patterns and the state of the forest. And this helps to inform decision makers on action to be taken to protect chimpanzees, their habitats, and the other creatures that live there. I flew in a small plane over Gombe National Park and I was absolutely horrified at what I saw. So quickly it seemed, the environment outside the National Park had been utterly destroyed. The trees had gone. The land was over farmed and infertile. They were struggling to survive. And that's when I realized that unless we helped the people to improve their lives, there was no way we could even try to save the precious chimpanzees. This was when we started Take Care or Takari, our community-centered conservation project. Everywhere I went, I met young people who seemed to have lost hope. They all said more or less the same thing. We feel like this because we think you've compromised our future. And so that led into our program for youth, Roots and Shoots. The main message of Roots and Shoots is that every one of us makes a difference every single day. The program has now become a movement that's in 100 countries around the world. One of the things that the Jane Goodall Institute does that I feel is really most important is to try and give people hope, to help people understand that every single day we live, we can make a difference. And together, with everybody making a difference, we can change the world. Well, that was absolutely wonderful. And I've just been watching the messages going past and it feels like we have people, an audience joining us from all around the United States and from as far away as Mexico and Paris, France and, and beyond. 
A very quick reminder, there is a Q&A function. If you've got questions, then please do put them in there. We will do our best to answer them. Uh, and if you're watching on YouTube, then if you're enjoying this, please use the like button. This really does help get the message out more broadly to a wider audience. And now over to Doug Heskey from New Day Impact to take us into the show. Doug. Nigel, thank you so much for the warm introduction. While yesterday was animal welfare day, today's event is about recognizing the intersection between humanity and our planet, between humanity and wildlife and animal welfare, and about the importance of preserving and protecting our world's ecosystems so that all of our planet's inhabitants can survive and thrive. Today's event is about recognizing heroes, the heroes in all of us that have the power and the responsibility to help others, especially those that cannot protect themselves. And there are many that are here today. Many are a part of the 600 people that have joined the call today and others that have captured the world's attention, including Olaza, Malala Yousafzai, Greta Thunberg, Jalen Arnold, and Jane Goodall. We operate in this world today where there are those that cling to what is and those with the imagination and vision to see where we can go and the courage and conviction to lead the way. Jane Goodall has always been that person. And today she will talk about hope. Hope is important, but not just for hope's sake, but because hope is and should be the consequence of action. So in the coming hours, days, and months, I implore all of you to lead the way. Over the past four years at New Day Impact, we have engaged with thousands of students and faculty members around the country as we've introduced our work into the K through 12 educational system and higher ed academic institutions. We have partnered with the SIFMA Foundation to introduce a sustainable decision-making process into the national stock market game. And last year co-created the SIFMA Sustainability Influencer Series. And through this work, we together are preparing a new generation of younger people to better understand ESG or environmental, social and governance investing and how to become impact investors. In the past four years, we will have engaged with more than 2 million younger people around ESG investing, which has historically been known as socially responsible investing. But today's version of SRI is more about identifying companies that are doing good things for our world, as opposed to just screening out bad companies operating in businesses that are bad for our world. Through this virtual program, students are taught that they can use the capital markets as a means to expressing their views and exercising their beliefs. We are giving them the tools for their future money management and investment decision-making that enables them to direct their personal resources and family resources to advance the work of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We are inspiring them to want to invest because they see it more than just making money and that it can actually address and even close the economic divide. We are enabling them to learn that impact investing has the potential, if done right, to advance their personal values and goals and to make the world a better place now and in the future. If asset flows into the ESG space or any indication, introducing sustainability into the national game has been a smashing success. In fact, 2020 shattered all previous records, having attracted more than $51 billion of investment into the space. And so far in 2021, we have blown away that record. And this is all for good reason. ESG, which focuses on companies that demonstrate favorable environmental, social, and governance characteristics, outperform those companies that don't, as measured by their operating performance and the financial performance of their common stock. It may also include screening out companies that might be characterized as having bad business practices or irresponsible business practices. And that by owning these companies in investment portfolios, you can generate alpha or added returns above what a stock index might deliver. After all, making good investments is really about selecting good companies and good companies are most often those companies that are responsible members of our community. New Day has furnished a list of these companies to the national stock market game for the past four years. New Day also builds investment portfolios that have been constructed around a subset of the UN SDGs, like clean water, ocean health, 
and wildlife conservation and animal welfare, which we're here to talk about today. Our wildlife conservation and animal welfare portfolio invests in companies that are working on improvements in animal health, protecting animal habitats, and developing vaccinations as an example for zoonotic diseases. The performance of this portfolio is, is evidence that it's working, that people don't have to sacrifice returns to accomplish social and environmental good. So let's get out there and lead, make change for the better, and be a part of this movement that Dr. Jane spoke about in the introductory video to protect our world and all of its inhabitants. Our work is about doing something about it. And it is for this reason that we are here today. So it is now my distinct honor to introduce to you my friend and colleague, Melanie Mortimer, president of the SIFMA Foundation. Thank you so much, Doug. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Thank you, Nigel Lake and Paul Herman. Again, Doug Heskey, Julia Drainville, Dr. Jane Goodall, and everyone at the Goodall Institute, and all of our teachers and students and guests joining in today. We cannot help but be inspired by the work of Jane Goodall, and we're so very fortunate to hear from her today. She says we have a choice to use the gifts of our lives to make the world a better place. And that's exactly what we do at the SIFMA Foundation. Since 1977, the SIFMA Foundation has helped to advance financial capability, economic equity, and opportunity for youth of all backgrounds, filling urgent gaps for schools, families, and communities. The SIFMA Foundation serves 600,000 students every year, including 300,000 girls, 250,000 students from economically underserved communities, and 200,000 youth of color every year. Our goal is to expand this reach to a million students each year. We know we need to do better. Financial illiteracy costs the world every day. It costs Americans alone $415 billion a year, according to the National Finance Educators Council. That averages about $1,600 per person. And when we think about how that $1,600 per person can be reinvested into this world, into the sustainability index that New Day has set up for our stock market game students, and we think about the long-term proceeds from that kind of an investment, wow, what a difference that would make. The SIFMA Foundation's programs are mainly serving students throughout the United States, but also in 63 countries around the world. We do this mainly through our flagship program, The Stock Market Game, which puts students into teams of three, four, and five each, who invest a hypothetical portfolio of $100,000 across stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and of course, ESGs. Students learn negotiation, cooperation, communication as they manage their portfolios together, but they also improve their math skills. They get a better understanding of current events and they learn how economic decisions can shape the future of this world. More importantly, they're in the driver's seat and they begin to understand the important role that they themselves can play in advancing their own effort to impact the world. And so now, before we go any further into what the students are doing, I think we're here to talk to one particular student and my colleague Liz Rydell is about to introduce us to her. We're really looking forward to the rest of today's program. I thank you deeply from the staff and the board of the SIFMA Foundation for joining us. And more importantly, remember that each of you has the capacity to make a difference in this world. We hope that we're giving you the tools that you need for financial independence at the SIFMA Foundation. And we look forward to seeing the great things you're all gonna do. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. I am so pleased to introduce our student interviewer, Julia Drainville. Julia is currently a middle schooler at Thurston Middle School in Westwood, Massachusetts. The SIFMA Foundation first became acquainted with Julia 
back in the fall of 2018, when she was not only part of the second place winning stock market game team, but she was the national first place elementary school winner in our InvestRight essay competition. InvestRight is our national essay competition where students apply their critical thinking skills and knowledge gained from the stock market game to a real world writing prompt. The prompt that semester required students to select an entrepreneur that they admire, research their company and explain how they would advise the entrepreneur to invest, invest in that company's assets. Julia selected the American Red Cross and highlighted the leadership of Clara Barton. She indicated in her essay that if she was the money manager for the American Red Cross, she would invest in bonds, stocks, and mutual funds. Also that year in fifth grade, her teacher Katie Valuti asked students to write a report on a famous scientist. Julia's choice, none other than Jane Goodall. Outside of school, Julia enjoys competitive dance in many styles, such as lyric, contemporary, jazz, ballet, and hip hop. And in her spare time, she enjoys reading and is always up for an adventure, especially if it involves airplane travel. So in, uh, please join me in welcoming Julia Drainville. Hey, Julia. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited for this opportunity. I am so pleased to have the honor of introducing world-renowned ethologist and conservationist, Dr. Jane Goodall. Over 60 years ago, Jane Goodall first set foot onto the shores of what is today Tanzania's Gombe National Park to begin her pioneering chimpanzee behavioral study. In the last six decades, this research has transformed scientific perceptions on the relationship between humans and animals. With her relation with her mission evolving into a quest to empower others to make the world a better place for all living things. In 1977, Dr. Goodall established the Jane Goodall Institute, a global leader in innovative conservation approaches that better the lives of local people living around chimpanzee habitats. Today, the Institute operates with 30 global offices supporting the research at Gombe. In addition to innovative community-centered conservation approaches, chimpanzee sanctuaries in Africa, and the Institute's international youth program, Jane Goodall's Roots and Shoots, celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Goodall had been traveling nearly 300 days a year on a perpetual world speaking tour, but can now be found giving virtual talks from her childhood home in Bournemouth, England. She is a United Nations Messenger of Peace and Dame of the British Empire. Her many awards and honors are simply too numerous to list. It brings me great pleasure to welcome to the virtual stage, Dr. Jane Goodall. Well, thank you, Julia, for all of that. And <laughs> anyway, let me just say a few very brief remarks because I know there's many, many questions and that's much more important than hearing me pontificate about who I am, but you all know who I am. And so basically from a child who loved animals, and I'm speaking to you from the home where I grew up in England on the south coast, Bournemouth. And so since the pandemic, I've been grounded here. But anyway, it was here that I dreamed about Africa. And of course, we didn't have any money and World War II was raging and everybody laughed at my dream. How would I get to Africa? We didn't have any money. And anyway, I was just a girl and girls didn't do that sort of thing. I'm nearly 88 now, so we're going back an awful long time. But um, I had a wonderful mother. And in the end, I got an invitation to Africa from a school friend for a holiday. And I worked as a waitress to earn the fare. And it was very hard work, by the way, and it was about, I don't know, five, six months, something like that. I went out to Africa by boat because there were not planes flying back and forth in those days. And first place I set foot in Africa was Cape Town. It was very exciting. But then on the doors to the restaurants and everywhere, I kept seeing these words in Afrikaans, Lex Blanc. And I said to the two friends who were 
taking me round while the ship refueled. What do these words mean? White people only. That I didn't I didn't want to stay there because I didn't grow up being taught to judge people by the colour of their skin. So anyhow, I got to Kenya. I heard about the late Dr. Lewis Leakey. I went to see him at the Natural History Museum in Nairobi. I think he was impressed by how much I knew, even though I was just out from the UK and I had not been to college because we couldn't afford it. And that led to him giving me the opportunity of going to live with our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees. So that was a long, hard struggle to get the chimps used to me, but eventually I was able to document their lives, which nobody had done before. Nobody, nobody had studied them in the wild. So I wasn't breaking into a male dominated, um, you know, area because there was nobody out there studying any wild animals except George Shala and two guys in South Africa. The best days of my life in Gombe. So why did I leave? I got there in 1960. I left full time in 1986, realizing that right across Africa, chimp numbers were diminishing, forests were going, and also learned about the horrible ways that chimps are treated in many captive situations. And so I went to a conference that I helped set up in 1986. And going as a scientist, because by then I had my PhD, I left as an activist. And I just knew I had to do something to help. And learning about what was going on with chimps, such as in medical research, I, I knew I had to try and help them. And then going around in to six of the research study sites, by then there were um, studying chimps and learning a lot about the plight of the chimps, but also learning about the plight of so many of the African people living in and around chimpanzee habitat. And this started a Jane Goodall Institute program, Take Care or Takari as we call it, very holistic because it hit me that if we didn't help these people living in poverty to find a way of making a living without destroying the environment, then we couldn't try and save chimps, forests or anything else. And so this program has been incredibly successful. It's in six other African countries. And by this time I was traveling around the world giving lectures about what was happening in Africa, but also learning about how we're harming the planet around the world, uh, which is shocking. And so I was meeting young people like you, Julia, who'd lost hope. And when I talked to them in all these different countries where I was going, they all said more or less the same. We feel like this because you people have harmed our future and there's nothing we can do about it. So we have harmed your future, no question. We've been stealing your future because of this crazy idea that there can be unlimited economic development on a planet with finite natural resources. But is it too late to do something about it? No, it's not. And so I began the program for young people that I think you know about, Julia, uh, Roots and Shoots, and that's now in over 65 countries and it's young people of all ages, from preschool, university, everything in between, and even now some adult groups. And these young people are my greatest reason for hope, because once you know the problems, once you are empowered to take action and people listen to you, then there's no way that you're going to let the world, you're going to let um, climate change and loss of biodiversity destroy the world. We can make change, but we have to get together and we have to get together now. So I'm going to stop there because I know there's lots of questions. Hi again, Dr. Goodall. I am so excited to be able to meet you and talk about all of the things that you've done with your life 
And thanks for taking the time today. And if it's okay with you, I was wondering if we could just jump right into the questions. As you mentioned earlier, the Jane Goodall Institute is widely recognized for its innovative community-centered and con community-centered conservation and development programs in Africa, along with your Youth and Shoots Youth Program. What are you most proud of in this moment in time? Well, I don't know what I'm most proud of. I mean, I think starting Roots and Shoots because that's the future, but also you know, after I've been studying the chimpanzees for about one and a half years, uh, Leakey told me I had to go to Cambridge and get a PhD. I'd never been to college, but he said, there's no time for a BA. So I was a bit scared. And imagine how I felt when I was told by these professors of whom I was a bit nervous, you cannot talk about chimpanzee personality. You can't talk about minds capable of solving problems and you can't talk about emotions why because those are unique to humans but i'd already learned as a child that that wasn't true and i'd learned from my great teacher my dog rusty you can't share your life with an animal of any sort and not know the professors were wrong so i quietly went on talking about the chimps so i was also told i should have given them numbers and not names which would have been very difficult but I mean, people today remember Flo and David Graybeard, they probably wouldn't remember six and 10, you know. So um, anyhow, that's, that's how, how it all began. And I did get my PhD and the professors gradually realized that I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't aggressive. I didn't confront them. I just went on talking about the facts as I saw them. And then the Geographic sent a filmmaker and he filmed it. And then the scientist had to agree. So that's how it began. So you say that a lot of your professors were very, did not agree with what you had to say. And I'm wondering what has been one of your most difficult minds to change or a hurdle that you've had to overcome that you've had success with? Well, I've had many, many hurdles to overcome. Um, the, most, the most difficult one was to get enough money to carry on with all our projects. That's not easy these days, but actually JGI is doing pretty well now. Um, the, hurdle, the hurdle that I met when I got into the scientific world were the people who said, well, why should we believe this young woman? She hasn't even been to college. But you know, by, by seeing the film, they kind of had to believe it. And the hurdle that I cr had to cross when I was confronting, but peacefully confronting, the people who were running the medical research labs. And here are our closest living relatives with their amazing lives in the wild, very social, and seeing them in five foot just imagine it, five foot by five foot, seven foot high, alone in these cages. And it was, it was just such a shock to me. It was an absolute shock. And I knew I had to do something. But again, I didn't tell the scientists, you know, that they were bad people. I talked about the Gombe chimpanzees. I showed film. And because I think when people change, they have to change from within. And so telling stories, showing pictures, and trying to reach the heart is the way to make change. And we have eventually, there's no more chimps in medical research. Going back to chimps and your beginning, when you first began your research, I'm really curious, how did you initially find the chimpanzees in Gombe? Well, first of all, with great difficulty. The chimps are very um, conservative. They've never seen a white ape before. Which, and we are white. You know, there's five great apes. There's the orangutan, which is least close to us genetically. And then comes the gorilla, next closest to us. Then there's the chimp and the bonobo, equally um, genetically close to us. 
and then there's us. We are biologically a great ape. So anyway, the chimps, when they first saw me, just vanished into the undergrowth. And it was a huge, huge problem because I only had money for six months. And after four months, I still couldn't get close to them. And fortunately, one of them, David Greybeard, showed me that chimps can use and make tools. He was fishing for termites with grass stems or picking leafy twigs, twigs and carefully peeling off the leaves. And um, that, that was very exciting to my mentor, Louis Leakey. And he's the one who sent me this telegram and said, well, now we shall have to redefine um, man, redefine tool or accept chimps as humans. Because at that time, we were defined by science as man, the tool maker. No, man, probably women started it. But anyway, that was how we were defined. And so, you know, eventually they did get used to me and the geographic at that point decided to continue funding the research, sent the photographer, filmmaker, and from there, everything was okay. That's really nice. You mentioned in when you were answering that question, if you didn't, I was wondering, if you didn't meet Dr. Leakey, where do you think you'd be today? Do you think you'd be the same place you are now or somewhere else? Where do you think you'd end up? I don't think I can answer that. I haven't the faintest, foggiest idea, but I'm absolutely sure I'd have found something to do with animals because I was born loving animals and fascinated by animals. So, you know, somehow I would have found a way, I'm sure. But I might Did have been hear? studying some kind of insect or, you know, I don't know what, but. <laughs> Switching gears a little bit. Many attendees listening to this discussion are stock market game students learning about sustainable investing and how your money can have a powerful impact on the world. As you mentioned, that money was a big issue at the beginning of your research. And what are some companies that you've worked with that are making a positive impact on sustainable investing? Well, actually, you know something, I'll tell you a story first. And it was a CEO of a big corporation in Singapore and I was talking to him the beginning of last week and he told me something which I think is very useful he said well the reason that companies and corporations are changing and becoming more environmentally sustainable is for, for me was for three reasons first of all we've seen the writing on the wall we've seen that if we go on exploiting natural resources at the rate we are now, where in some cases they're being ex used up faster than nature can replenish them, then our businesses will fail. So we need to find a different way, a more ethical way and sustainable way of working with the environment. Secondly, he said, consumer pressure. People are beginning to understand that some products are made in a very unethical way and the people who are producing them are not paid a good wage. They're being produced with enormous environmental damage. And in some cases, it involves forced labor and certainly very, very unfair wages. So because of consumer pressure, people don't want to buy things made unethically. We have to change. But he said the real the final straw for me was when my this happened about five years ago he said my little girl came back from school she was 10 i think and she said daddy i oh is what you're doing hurting the environment that's what people are telling me that you're hurting the environment and that's what i'm growing up to live in is it true daddy and he said that was it that got straight to my heart and it was the final straw. And yes, we are now becoming very sustainable. So some of the um, some of the uh, corporations that we're now working with, because they are sustainable, there's DocuSign, and they have this wonderful method where you can sign documents legally without any paper at all. 
and uh, they're absolutely wonderful and they've started Roots and Shoots among all their staff and their staff's families all around the world. And then there's um, Neptune Wellness Solutions and this guy is amazing and he produces various kind of products but so environmentally ethical it just isn't true and he's producing some beauty products but every single one um, you know is, is totally sustainable and then there's DocuSign one of the biggest corporations and they really are working so hard to be 100% um, carbon neutral and environmentally sustainable and Patagonia of course the clothing company that first started really caring about the environment when they manufactured their clothes those are just some of the ones we're working with I've definitely heard of some of these companies and I'm trying to also make a sustainable impact on the world as well and I know that a lot of kids that I know and a lot of kids around the world are also doing the same thing as well as children that are participating in your youth program. So I was also curious, what are one or two things that you think we can do to help the world move in a positive direction? Okay, well, as you know, one of the main, um, one of the main messages of Roots and Shoots is that every individual matters and makes a difference and makes a difference every day and we get to choose what sort of difference we make unless people are living in absolute poverty in which case they can't make those choices they just have to do whatever they can to stay alive and to keep their families fed but you and me we can go shopping and we can choose we can say did this product in its manufacture harm the environment was it cruel to animals uh, is it cheap because of unfair wages or forced labor? And if it is, don't buy it. That's one way that we can all do. Or if we're very young, we, we persuade our parents to do the same. But then if you want one thing to do right now that really will have an impact on the planet, it's to move to a plant-based diet because the, there are various reasons for this. For me, it's, it started off ethical. The, these factory farms where we crowd billions of animals in terribly cruel conditions. And when I learned about these factory farms, it was the late 60s, and I looked at the next piece of meat on my plate and I thought, this represents fear, pain, death. I don't want to eat it. So I became a vegetarian. And since the pandemic, I've actually been vegan. But the, the other thing, which is why it's so important, really, is that these billions of animals have to be fed. Huge areas of the natural world are destroyed to grow the grain to feed the animals. In fact, more grain is grown to feed animals than all the people who are starving of hunger. And then masses of fossil fuel to get the grain to the animals, the animals to the abattoir, and the meat to the table. In addition, it takes a lot of water, and water is increasingly scarce in some areas because of the climate change and droughts to change vegetable to animal protein. And finally, they're all producing methane during their digestion, and that's a very, very virulent greenhouse gas, not as, as um, not as plentiful in these greenhouse gases as CO2, but very virulent. And so for all those reasons, moving to a plant-based diet is really, really important. Throughout this seminar and also looking at your website, I was really curious that you seem very hopeful when there's a lot of negative things happening in the world where people, as you mentioned earlier, destroying our planet. And I was really curious, what is the most hopeful thing that you think is happening in the world right now, especially when we're having trouble with all this? Okay, well, first of all, hope is important because if we lose hope, that's the end. Because if you lose hope, you fall into apathy and do nothing. 
and if everybody becomes apathetic and does nothing that's it especially if you young people um you know become apathetic which is why i started roots and shoots because so many young people were becoming apathetic but the hope well there's various reasons for hope and i think it's hopeful that right now climate change loss of biodiversity are coming up to the top of political agendas whether that's going to lead to change so often it's just talking but let's hope that this time because of climate change isn't just hitting the the developing world where people can say oh, well it's nothing to do with me now the people in the the um, developed world the wealthy nations they're feeling the impact I mean just a couple of weeks ago Hurricane Ida think what it ha what it did in America the terrible hurricanes the flooding in New York um, the flooding we've had in Europe this year so although it's horrible for the people who are suffering in a way it's good because it's waking people up just as this pandemic so the pandemic climate change loss of biodiversity or we brought upon ourselves by our absolute disrespect of animals and disrespect of the natural world. And we must remember, even if we live in the middle of a city, we're part of the natural world. We depend on it for clean air, for clean water, for food, for shelter, for everything. And whether you live in a rural area or whether you live in a city, you still depend on the natural world. And so it's pretty sad that so many people are dissociated from the natural world. I mean, you look around at kids today, they're on their cell phones, they're watching video games, even if they're in a beautiful place, they're not looking. So, you know, getting getting kids out into nature as early as possible. That's really, really important. Because once you, I mean, you watch children, I watched the other day, a little boy, he was three years old and he was watching a snail you know how they glide along the ground and he was watching this snail and suddenly he picked it up he put it on the window he ran inside to look at it from the inside like how is the snail doing this well that's the kind of curiosity that leads to young scientists and it's lovely today that so many young people can get involved in citizen science get involved in uh, you know, butterfly counts and the, the migration of birds and, and uh, the monarch butterflies and so on. So, okay, you asked how I had hope. It's because it's because the awareness of the problems is rising and it's because young people are becoming becoming passionate. I mean, like you, you're passionate, aren't you? And don't you think that if we get together, we can turn things around? Definitely. Yes, well, you see, that's it. So this is what gives me inspiration because everywhere I go around the world, I meet young people in Roots and Toots or similar programs who are a totally hopeful that yes, we can. So thank you, Julia, because you know, it's you and people like you that give me hope to carry on. Thank you so much. I was also, I wanted to ask a couple more questions. And as you mentioned earlier from that last question, you were talking a lot about stories with other children that you saw. And that kind of reminded me of the stories that I've heard about you from all the biographies and a lot of websites as well. For example, the Earthworm story and your hen house story, which I found really enjoyable. And I was curious, can you describe for me, particularly your mother or and your family, how they encouraged your scientific curiosity from the very beginning, like a lot of kids today are? Okay, well, I was born, as I say, loving animals. And people say, what triggered it? I Nothing. I mean, I just was born that way. And of course, when I was growing up, there was no TV. Um, we have a lovely garden here. I came here when I was five years old and so we learn from being in nature and we learn from books and uh, I 
with this love of animals, I had this supportive mother. So when I was one and a half years old, I don't remember this, but she told me. She came into my room uh, one night, say good night, and there were all these earthworms in my bed. And she said, Jane, you were watching them so intently. I think you were wondering, how do they walk without legs? Anyway, instead of getting mad at me because of all the earth in my bed, she just said, I think we should take them in the garden. They'll probably die if we leave them here. And then um, when I was four and a half, before we came here, we lived in London. Well, not many animals in a big city. So it was very exciting when she took me for two weeks onto a farm, a proper, proper farm, where animals were rootling around in the fields and hens were pecking in the farmyards. And I was given this job to collect hen's eggs. So I was, uh, they, they were mostly laying their eggs in these little hen houses where they slept at night. And there were nice straw nest boxes around the edge. So you could walk around the hen house, open the lid, and if there was an egg, I would pop it in my basket. So apparently I was asking everybody, but where's the hole on the hen big enough for the egg to come out? I couldn't see a hole like that. And you won't either. So nobody told me. So one day I just happened to see this hen. I, this is, I remember it so vividly, a brown hen going into one of these hen houses. And I must have thought, ah, she's going to lay an egg. So I crawled after her. Well, that was a mistake. She flew out with squawks of, I suppose, fear. And I must have, again, in that little four-year-old mind, thought, well, no hen's going to lay an egg here. It's a frightening place. But I'm on the path of discovery. So I went into an empty hen house and waited. And apparently, I waited for about four hours. My mother had no idea where I was. She even called the police. But when she saw this excited little girl rushing towards the house, instead of getting angry, how dare you go off without telling us, don't you dare do it again, which would have killed the excitement. She saw my shining eyes and sat down to hear the wonderful story of how a hen lays an egg. And the reason I love that story is that's the making of a little scientist. Curiosity, asking questions, not getting the right answer deciding to find out for yourself, making a mistake, not giving up, and learning patience. It was all there, and a different mother might have, well, with a different mother, I might not have done what I've done. And it's a message to all parents. You may be a parent one day. Support the interest of your child. Don't force the child to do something you think they ought to do, unless unless they're set on doing something that's really bad, and then of course, you can try and change their minds. But so many people I've met, especially in Asia, they want their children to go into business to make money, 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 money. And that's one of the great evils of the world. We need money to live. But if we live for money, then, then well, unless we live for money to make the world a better place. So I always say people to people, well, if you live for money to make the world a better place, that's good. And please give some of it to the Jane Goodall Institute. <laughs> As you mentioned earlier, again, um, there are a lot of people around the world that inspire you to continue moving forward. And I am definitely inspired by you and all that you've done. And I was curious, could you provide a specific story of someone that has inspired you? Like you gave a story about your mother and a bunch of other children from Roots and Shoots that really inspired you. I was wondering if you could provide a specific story. Well, you know, there's so many people who've inspired me. I couldn't have done what I've done without these amazing people around the world. But, you know, one of my reasons for hope is the indomitable human spirit, the people who tackle what seems impossible and won't give up. And so I've been really inspired because I landed in Africa in the height of apartheid. I've always looked up to Nelson Mandela, who labored for 17 years in a, in a, um, 
in, in the mines and nevertheless finally came out and had the amazing ability to forgive. So I've always admired him. Also Martin Luther King Jr. But then there's all the ordinary people who overcome terrible social problems, like a, a migrant who arrives with nothing and somehow manages to build a little life for himself and makes a little business. And although he may have been disrespected, he may have been discriminated against, he may not have had any friendship extended to him. Nevertheless, if you stop and talk to him or her, then they'll smile. And it, it's just amazing to see that spirit that they have. And then I've met people with unbelievably terrible physical disabilities, and they are just so inspiring. Like Chris Koch, I met in Canada. He was born with no arms and legs. His arms are about this long, and it's a little tiny. It's about the size of a wrist coming out of his shoulders. And one of them has a tiny stub that I suppose was a thumb. And he's got one, it, I don't know, I suppose it was a foot, but it comes out of his thigh. And he, he had parents who never told him there was anything he could not do. You do what your brothers and sisters do. And he's been around Europe on a skateboard. He pushes off with this foot thing, this flipper thing. Um, and last time I met him, you know, he pushes up and gets quite high onto the sofa. And you, you look into his eyes and you're looking into somebody who's so full of life and energy. And, and, and so we were talking and I said, has anybody offered you uh, prosthetic limbs? And he said, well, yes, they have. And I did try some, but he said, you know, I think I was put together this way for a reason. And I think I'll stay the way I am. And then with a big twinkle in his eyes, he said, but I might take them up on the prosthetic legs when I decide to climb Mount Everest. So, I mean, this, you know, a sense of humor is so very important. It was a sense of humor that got the British people through the terrible World War II when London was being blitzed. And if we hadn't had this, this, this sense of humor and we hadn't had Churchill's speeches rousing us to say we'll never be defeated. So I was only a child, but I think living through a time which seemed absolutely hopeless, England wasn't prepared for war and we, we didn't have proper defenses. We didn't have a, a big uh, army. We didn't have a big air, uh, um, Navy. We only had the air force, brave young men who went out and got killed and got killed, but still they volunteered and enlisted. And Churchill with his speeches, and there was one lovely speech he made when the rest of Europe had either been overrun, defeated, or capitulated, and there was just Britain standing up against the might of Nazi Germany. And Churchill made one of his most famous speeches, we will never be defeated, the British will fight them on the beaches, fight them in the lanes, fight them in the cities. And then he was heard as an aside to a friend to say, and we'll fight them with the broken ends of bottles because that's bloody well all we've got. <laughs> so, you know, there's that sense of humor that, that gets you through bad times. And by the way, I just heard two days ago about a man, a very successful businessman, and he was bicycling and he was hit by a car and he was totally paraplegic. And last two weeks ago, it was the anniversary of the date of his accident. And he said, I want all my friends to celebrate with me. And so people said, well, how can you celebrate this terrible accident? He said, well, I've heard it's the worst time that first year when you have to come to terms with the fact you'll never walk again, you'll never move your arms and legs again. Um, but you have physiotherapy and little muscles are beginning to move. And so I want to celebrate. I mean, isn't that amazing?
I mean, that's what I mean by the indomitable human spirit. It always tears me up to think of these incredible people. Of course we'll survive. Of course we'll defeat climate change. Of course we'll, we'll reverse the loss of biodiversity, save the forests, clean up the ocean, because all of you young people are determined to do it, right? Yes, yeah. definitely. Yes. Thank you so much for sitting with me this afternoon and sharing your life, your journey and experience. I'm really grateful for this opportunity and inspired by your work across this great planet. I could ask you a million more questions, but I'm sure others would like to do so as well. So I'll turn it back over to the Sigma Foundation. Thank you. Well, Julia, you are a wonderful interviewer and I can't tell you how many really bad interviewers I have since I've been on Zoom during the pandemic. Some really stupid people who don't know anything, who've never bothered to read anything, who ask the most silly, silly questions. Like, you know, what, how, how, what, what do I do about makeup? I mean, really silly things. And what about hairdressing? Stupid stuff. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, and Julia, so, so much for your great questions. And um, Dr. Goodall, we have so many questions for you. We want to be cognizant of the time. Um, and the questions run the gamut. Um, we'll start with a really cute short one. And this one comes from Ben in Connecticut. Was Jane in Disney's Tarzan named after you? Well, that's actually, I was inspired by Tarzan when I was 10 years old. I don't think there was a Disney at that time. And Tarzan, the, the, the original book, Edgar Rice Burroughs, had Tarzan marrying Jane. So Disney's Jane didn't exist. And I wasn't inspired by uh, Tarzan's Jane. I was extremely jealous of Tarzan's Jane, having read the book. I've never seen a film on Tarzan because my mother took me to a film uh, it was one of the Johnny Weissmuller early Tarzan films and she saved up money because we didn't have any and it was my my real present and I started crying sobbing she had to take me out she said whatever's the matter I said that isn't Tarzan because you see before television you read a book and you used your imagination so I had an imaginary Tarzan and it wasn't Johnny Weissmuller it's amazing. Um, so this question comes from Ray in Minnesota, um, and it's amazing how many um, how many locations um, people are on the call. They're around the world. So Ray from Minnesota asks, "You are someone who has had an incredible impact on ethology, ecology, and the relationship between humans and animals of the world." If you could find the answer to one question that has eluded you in your research, what would it be? <laughs> well, gosh, I mean, there's, there's, I, I think I have to answer that by saying that today we're finding out so much about animal intelligence, animal adaptation. We're finding completely new species down in the depth of the ocean and up in the canopies, animal species that have never been, uh, you know, documented before, completely new. It is the time for young people who are interested in animal behavior to go out there and learn. I suspect many people listening have seen my octopus teacher. And, you know, so it's not just the great apes who are intelligent and elephants and, and dolphins, whales, and, and um, of course dogs. I mean, dogs are my special. It was my dog who taught me that the professors in Cambridge were wrong. And so, it, it's you know, we now, now know about birds. Some birds are, are brighter at solving some problems than an eight-year-old human. Wow. Now we know that octopuses are intelligent and people have even documented intelligence in bumblebees. And so there's just so much out there to learn. And I, I wouldn't be able to pick one thing that's most interesting. It's just, there's everything to learn, so much. 
But the key is we're destroying these species before we have learned about them. That's what we have to stop. And that's a good segue into our next question. This question comes from Jean Marie in Bedford. With the recent oil spill off the coast of Southern California, environmental problems seem overwhelming. I do still have hope, but what would be the most productive use of my time and effort to help? At home, we conserve energy and water, recycle, eat local food, minimize plastics. It's still not going to affect the kind of change we need. Any recommendations? Well, first of all, if everybody, if everybody thinks about the way they behave each day, then it does move us towards a better world. But the suggestion I have for people is tackle something that you are passionate about. You can't tackle it all. There are these major problems around the world. And with this oil spill, I don't know what you as an individual can do, but you might be able to raise some money to help clean up after the oil spill, to help, uh, you know, help the animals who've been coated in oil. You might be able to write letters to legislators I don't know what you can do, but just choose something you think you can do and do it. And don't, don't get depressed because there's so much you can't do. We all can only do what we do. And we need to do something we're passionate about because then we'll do it best. Um, next question comes from Jeanette in California. And many of the people who are on our call today are teachers. We want to give teachers a specific uh, shout out since it's International Teachers Day. Um, but how can students of little economic resources be effective in sustaining our environmental global community? Well, you know, it's quite amazing. When, and, and I would like to say that without teachers, Roots and Shoots wouldn't have grown. And we have huge respect for teachers. And one of the ways we've grown Roots and Shoots is by teacher workshops and teachers come and, you know, I mean, Roots and Shoots has really taken off. So some, some schools have incorporated the Roots and Shoots philosophy that every individual matters, that we need to understand the relationship between animals, people and environment. They've incorporated into the school curricula. That's happened in a number of countries. So, uh, a big shout out, I join in the shout out to the teachers. And um, what was the, say the question part of it again? I got um, students of little economic resources be effective. Okay, okay. When, when I started Roots and Shoots in the US, I wanted to know if it would work in a poverty, in a, in a de deprived area, like in an inner city. So one of the schools I went to was in the Bronx. It said at the time it was the second poorest school in the country. And so I went and gave a talk, and this is back in 96, I think. And there were teachers going up and down the aisles. Afterwards, they told me they were looking for knives. Today it'd be guns, I suppose. And I didn't think the kids had you know, I, I thought I'd try, talked a bit about the chimps and a little bit about roots and shoots. Well, a year later, I got an invitation from the head of the school who said, please, Jane, come back. We want to show you the impact that you had. So I went back and there were three different roots and shoots groups, different ages. They were mostly black or Latino. And the head teacher said, Jane, they are making presentations to you and you've seen more sophisticated presentations. These kids have never made presentations before. And they made amazing presentations. One of them decided to talk about styrofoam. They wanted styrofoam out of the school lunch boxes. So they learned up about it and they did a little skit where there were three roots and shoots people confronting the CEO of a big styrofoam company and telling him how bad it was. They got styrofoam out of their school lunch boxes. Wow. And then there was this little boy. He was 10 years old the year before, 
I didn't meet him, um, but he, he was a, a kid who sat in the back of the class. All their brothers and sisters were members of gangs, and so all the kids were wearing hoods, and he was mostly playing truant. So I get back, and this kid, Trevor, Travis, Travis, he's no hood, stands up in front of me, very straight, and he said, I, I was upset by seeing chimpanzees dressed up in clothes, and you told me how cruel it was. And I saw a chimpanzee wearing clothes, and they said he was smiling. He was on a cereal packet. And I remember you saying, when a chimp grins like that, he's not smiling, he's frightened. And that's when I, no. And so I wrote to you and you said, yes, Travis, you're right. That's when I decided to take action. So it was a little group of two and they wrote to the cereal company. And of course, there were other kids around the world, around America writing, but they didn't know that. So he got a letter back saying, Mr. Travis, thank you. And the package, the picture was withdrawn. So think what that did. So that's the kind of thing. And these, these underprivileged children, they gravitate to roots and shoots even more than privileged children, because for the first time, they're being told that they matter. They're being told that they make a difference. And it doesn't matter what they do. It is changing lives. I get messages all the time. Um, so before we're cognizant of your time, um, we have one final question before we do a call to action question. And I think this is a question that many of our students are asking or thinking. They want to know, and this one comes from a fourth grader in from Briar Lake Elementary School in Atlanta, Georgia. How often do you get to interact with chimps now? Do you get to go visit chimps in Africa? Do you interact with them um, frequently or not so much? No. First of all, since the pandemic, I haven't been able to go back to Tanzania. Even before that, I was visiting, but uh, seldom saw the chimps because either they're high up and, you know, I've got a wonky knee, so it's stupid for me to climb very high. It's very skiddy and slippery and stuff. And um, if they're low down, they're surrounded by tourists these days, and that doesn't interest me at all. So, But um, we don't interact with them because we now know that they can catch all our diseases. And so we didn't know that before. And when I used to interact with the chimps, I had no idea that basically we could have been exposing them. But for a long time now, we haven't actually interacted with them. We only interact with the ones in our sanctuaries for orphan chimps whose mothers have been killed. And those we have to interact with because they've lost their mother and they need comfort and they need us to cuddle and embrace them when they're young, before they're introduced to other young ones. And hopefully one day we'll go back into the wild. So, you know, things have changed. We shouldn't be interacting with wild animals. We shouldn't have wild animals as pets. And it's the pet trade uh, that, that's been partially responsible for the coronavirus pandemic. So we have to respect animals. They need to be in nature. And if they are, have to be rescued, then we need to treat them with great respect. And finally, we're going to wrap up today's session with a call uh, to action from each one of our guests. And the final question is from Jill in Utah. What do you think is the most important skill that children should be learning today to be prepared for the future? So I'm going to first pose this question to Paul Herman of Hip Investor. there. Thanks everybody for joining today. So inspirational, Dr. Jane, to have you share your life experience with us and how we can continue to build a better world. Um, I'd say, I think what I've learned from you today are several things. One, always speak the truth, even to people who don't see it yet. It's so important to speak the truth, especially as sometimes uh, the non-truths or lies can propagate. Two is always ask and explore. The worst that can happen is somebody could say no. 
And what I'm so inspired is when you were doing your PhD, nobody saw it until you brought the evidence. So bringing evidence and data uh, and real life views. And third, lead by example. All of us can lead by example and we inspire others even if they don't talk to us. And so just by doing something positive, other people will see it, feel comfortable with it and copy it. So in summary, um, uh, I think just like your new book, The Book of Hope, the advice is have hope, be hopeful, take initiative, especially for impact, and be proactive. Have hope, take initiative for impact, and be proactive. And uh, as you summed up, Jane, you know your money, whether you shop, where you bank, where you work, how you invest, who you donate to, it can be used for good, and it can build a better world. So thanks so much, Dr. Jane, very inspiring and um, hopeful, and uh, we'll all hope to carry on your mission. Thank you, Paul. Doug, Doug Heskey. Doug, you're on you're on mute. Mute. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Liz. I'm gonna piggyback on some of the messages that Jane shared today and that Paul shared as well. And this isn't just applicable to younger people, but everybody. Be bold and fearless. And we have an adage that we use at this organization that success favors the bold. And there are a lot of events that people attend like this one today and they get inspired. And then two days later, they go back to their normal lives. And I think that given what's going on in our communities today around climate change, around carbon emissions and all of these other important things that we are fighting as a community against, it's important for everybody to engage. So I would encourage all of you to right now, write down on a piece of paper, okay, and pin it up on your refrigerator or on a cabinet, that hope is a consequence of action and we should all be taking that action. I had an opportunity two years ago before the pandemic to listen to a young woman down in Florida at an event who was talking about the importance of becoming a vegetarian or a vegan. And this doesn't have to be an all or nothing type thing. So she said, start one day a week, start one meal a day. And what's happened for me and my family is, is that we have incorporated this into our daily lives and have migrated off of you know, a meat diet almost entirely, right? And that becomes really, really important, especially given the fact that the agriculture business is one of the few industries that hasn't made meaningful progress with reference to reduction of carbon emissions. So, you know, we share with our community the importance of getting informed around these really important issues and getting involved. And there's something that all of us can be doing today, but it has to be a daily occurrence. It can't be once a month or once a year or even once a week. You know, the drive that you're going to take down to the grocery store, if it's close enough, ride your bike or walk or something like that. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing. And so I would encourage, especially younger people that are on this call today to be bold, to reach out to your Congress people and everything, to fight for climate action and all of these things that Dr. Goodall has suggested on the call today that we all need to become a part of. Thank you, Doug. Melanie. Thank you, Liz. Um, this has been so inspiring and there's so many great ideas. So I think I'll go back to uh, the idea of investing in the gifts that you have, including the gift of your life to make the world a better place. Um, invest in yourselves, invest in learning, invest in making every day count. I would recommend that you ask yourself at the start of each day, what am I going to do today to make the world a bigger place? Uh, sorry, a better place. Uh, whether it's big or small, ask yourself, what action can I take to achieve that outcome? I think with that guidance, each and every day can count. And ultimately, over a lifetime, the impact that you can have in that capacity is significant and real. Thank you, Melanie. And finally, Dr. Goodall. Well, you know, you've heard all my messages, so it's really superfluous. But I think I want to say as a final message for everybody, 
is to remember that you as an individual matter, that you as an individual have some role to play. Maybe it was, maybe you were born with a mission, I don't know, but you have a role to play. And that every day each one of us lives, we make some impact on the planet. So the opposite of thinking about what you can do to make the world better each morning when you wake up is at the end of the day to say, well, did I leave the world a better place or not? In Tanzania, where Roots and Shoots began, when I went back about three years ago, there was one of the large gatherings that we do, and we had Roots and Shoots groups from all around the Dar es Salaam area. And we bring these groups together so they can share what they're doing with each other and they can get inspired and they bring uh, storyboards and things like that to share. And I found at the end, they were all getting together and saying, together we can save the world. And I said to them, yes, we can. We have the answers. We know what we should be doing banning industrial farming, banning uh, banning the factory farms. We should be clearing up the ocean. We, we should be saving forests. We should be planting trees. We should be doing all these things. But will we? Do we have, do we have the, the commitment to do them? We know what to do, but will we do it? So now, at the end of every gathering, they say, together we can, together we will. And so when I'm addressing an audience, and the last time I did this live was at Davos two years ago, and a whole room full of CEOs and some government people, they all leapt to their feet. Because when I said, can you join me? Do you care? Uh, at the end of my talk, I said, join me. Together we can, together we will. It was a very pathetic, feeble response. And I said, my goodness, the children do so much better than you. Shall we try it again? And they all leapt to their feet and said, together we can, together we will. And afterwards, um, a, a, a political reporter from New York came up to me and he said, Jane, I've been coming to Davos for years. I never would have thought that anybody could get a group of people like that to stand up and shout out like that. He said, it brought tears to my eyes. So together we can, together we will, is the message I leave with everybody today. Thank you so much, Jane. And I am sure if you could peek inside many of the classrooms that are on the call today, you would hear the students chant. And I'm sure the teachers are leading their students with that chant. So we are so appreciative of the time that you spent with us today, your knowledge, your, pa your passion, um, and just your incredible story. Um, so we are, we are so appreciative. So thank you. Thank you also to Nigel, Doug, and Melanie for joining us today. Um, we're, what a wonderful, wonderful event. And I'm really and sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, but if there's any really good ones and you email them to my Mary Lewis, I'll try and answer them. Okay, because I mean, though I know there were so many questions coming up. And I'm going to end off with a greeting that's the chimpanzee distance greeting, which uh, seems very appropriate since we're all over the place like that, demonstrating the human intellect, by the way. And it would be. <laughs> and many of the children probably met Mr. A. She's very famous. He's been with me for um, 28 years. He's been to 61 countries. So he would like to say hello. And if I didn't introduce him, he would be very pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the note that I will say goodbye to everyone. And God bless you. And remember that every day you make a difference, make a good one. Bye. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That was incredibly inspirational. I think there's probably not a, a dry eye in the house. I know I've certainly had a few pretty emotional moments myself. 
Thank you all so much for joining us today. ESGX is all about people and all about action and what we can each do to make a real difference for our families, for our communities and the world in which we live. For future episodes, please do visit ESGX.org. I know there were a lot of questions about a variety of topics today. Some of these, not all of them, but some of them we have covered, including everything around alternative proteins and alternative sources or alternative diets very recently. Next week, we have a fascinating discussion coming up with Dr. Fidel Kaboob and New York Times bestselling author, Dr. Stephanie Kelton, about better ways to help support the development of emerging nations, which are not extractive. So very much on topic for one of the things brought up today. Whilst you're here and whilst we still have you, please do use the like button if you're watching this on YouTube. Every time someone presses that button, another 10 or 20 or 30 people watch the video. So it really does have an impact to transmit the message more broadly. And lastly, let me leave you with this one thought. Jane indeed said today that she went to the jungle as a scientist and an anthropologist and came back as an activist. Now, I studied science but I ended up going into the world of business and the world of finance. And somewhere too, I also turned into an activist. So I hope everybody here has found something in this discussion which inspires you, as it's done me, because it's making my voice break to talk about it, to stand up, to speak out, to take action in some way that you can have an impact on to preserve and celebrate our amazing world. So thank you all very much and look forward to seeing you again soon.